I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York City. An army vet and her dog mysteriously vanished. Don Chewy, I miss you. This is the last image of Julia Jacobson caught on a store's security camera. It just breaks my heart. Not a thing out of place in her apartment. Her car abandoned a half mile away. What happened to Julia? And does a mysterious stranger in her life hold the key? Julia didn't really speak about him much. Then... He forced you to have sex. Multiple times. Your own see. father. A dark family secret... He would tell me because he loved me. You were 11. ...ends in a shocking headline-making murder for hire. And I just said, who would be crazy enough to kill somebody for money? And he said, I would. A teenage girl orders her father's execution to end the abuse. Today, Cheryl Cuccio tells me her story that rocked Long Island. I would have kept that secret to my grave. Right now. Go, let's go. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. I'm Michelle Sagona from Crime Watch Daily. This. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. It's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. You got anything to say? It's Crime Watch Daily. What do you mean you don't know she's 13? You're running away now? Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. We start today on the other coast in California, where a U.S. Army captain who served two tours in Iraq is missing. And police say the facts in this case are very suspicious. Our Anna Garcia has the all-new details. It's the mystery of the missing Army vet. What happened to Julia Jacobson? Where would she go? Julia and her dog, Boogie, just vanished. Right off the streets of San Diego. It just breaks my heart. Did she run away? Did she get lost hiking? Or was she kidnapped? This is something where I think the worst. A distraught family in agony. Just want her home safe. And a little boy lost. Don Chewy, I miss you. Julia is the youngest of the four Jacobson siblings, but to her big sister, Casey, she's the tough one. Strong, brave, and adventurous just very caring, willing to do anything for anyone. And big brother Tony says that willingness to do anything is one reason Julia joined the Army after she graduated from college. We were always very proud of her for doing that and the fact that she wanted to go and wanted to continue to make an impact around the world. Uh, that, that's the sister I know. Who wouldn't be proud of a sister who quickly rose to captain, did two tours in Iraq, and performed top secret missions? We do have a great picture of her um, over in Iraq, and she's holding a large um, sum of money. So basically her job, um, she was a finance captain, and so she flew around in helicopters and gave money to various people. Those packages are filled with thousands of dollars in cash. After her hitch was over, Julia went to work for a convenience store chain. And then she married a guy. Julia didn't really speak about him much. Who remained a mystery man to the family. She was living in Denver when she met him, and I think it was some way through social media. I'm not sure how. Casey says the marriage to the amateur MMA fighter didn't last very long. He was never really had gainful employment, and she was just tired of supporting him. Julia's divorce had been final for less than a year when her mother was dying from cancer. Casey says her mom's battle brought her back together in a strange way with her ex. She was in contact with him a little bit and that uh, he watched her dog. She did at least say that you know, he, he seemed to be making amends and seeing the errors of his ways, whatever that, whatever that meant. Julia's focus was on an exciting new job offer in Texas. Before she moved, she wanted to visit Palm Springs, about 140 miles from San Diego. So on Labor Day weekend, Julia and her dog Boogie were up at the crack of dawn. She was seen at 6.30 in the morning in San Diego at a 7-Eleven wearing shorts and a tank top. This image from a surveillance camera is the last known picture of her. 
Casey says the family first knew something was wrong when Julia didn't make her daily call to her father. Julia was very, very close to my father and called him every day to check on him. The family allowed us into Julia's apartment, nothing out of place. It looked as if she had every intention to return home. The tracking device on her car was triggered and cops found it five days later on this corner, a half mile from her home. Her car was unlocked, which is very unusual because she's been broken into a couple times. And in the car, they found something strange, very strange. The windows were all down at different levels. The windows were down and the keys were inside. Several hours after she left home, Julia was spotted in Ontario, California, which is oddly in the opposite direction of Palm Springs. In that Ontario sighting as well, police have told us that Boogie was with her. As hours turned into days, the family took matters into their own hands. They didn't have to go far to find a private investigator. Julia's older brother, John, is a PI. He came out here, looked through her house to see if there um, were any clues about where she might have been or who she was with. There was a camera located fairly close to where her vehicle was found. The video would show the intersection of where the car might have traveled. Could her ex-husband be on that video? Sources tell Crime Watch Daily he told cops he saw Julia on the day she went missing, but we're told he is cooperating with investigators and is not a suspect or a person of interest. All San Diego cops can tell us is that this is an active case and they want to find Julia. There have been candlelight vigils in Julia's hometown of Bismarck, North Dakota and San Diego, pleading for her safe return. We're not gonna stop until we find her. But no plea is more heart-wrenching than this video from Casey's son, Julia's nephew. Please don't, please don't Julie. I miss you. I want you to play with me. Take one more look at these pictures of Julia Jacobson. Anyone with information about where she might be is urged to call the San Diego Police Department's Missing Persons Unit at 1-619-531-2277. Or you can submit a tip anonymously at CrimeWatchDaily.com. Coming up, the all-American cheerleader, her dad dead in the driveway. It was the murder for hire plot that rocked Long Island. I didn't think of the murder part, and I didn't think about the killing part. I just wanted it to stop. Now, Cheryl Cuccio sits down with me for a candid interview. Do you still ask yourself, why did he do this to me? Every day. Next. Our next story is from right here in New York, where five gunshots means the end of one man's life, but the start of an almost unbelievable real-life soap opera complete with dark family secrets and a cheerleader in the middle of a murder-for-hire plot. A scandal that rocked Long Island. A father riddled with bullets in his own driveway. I look out the sliding glass doors and I see my father laying on the concrete. Cops uncover a murder-for-hire plot. I paid the guy who shot him. The prime suspect, the dead man's very own teenage daughter. I didn't think of the murder part, and I didn't think about the killing part. Why would an all-American cheerleader want her dad gunned down? She wouldn't tell anybody. Now, for the first time, Cheryl Cuccio is setting the record straight. I would have kept that secret to, to my grave. And what she says went on inside this house will leave you horrified. Your own father. Yep. Along with her older brother Jim and little sister Joanne, Cheryl was raised in a quiet suburb on Long Island. By all appearances, a typical middle-class life. It was, you know, average family. My mother was a stay-home mom. Um, my father worked um, as an electrician. Very strict parent my father was. A very abrasive kind of person. Um, my mother was very mild-mannered. He was dominant in the household. Very dominant. 
um, people feared him. Cheryl's high school sweetheart, Rob, was one of those people. How would you describe Cheryl's father? He was very strict, very rough, and very intimidating. You knew there was no messing around? Oh, absolutely not. We ate dinner. We had to eat counterclockwise, meat, potato, vegetables. We couldn't eat out of order. We weren't allowed to drink. We weren't allowed to talk. We weren't allowed to look up. Despite Cheryl's portrayal, by all accounts, her father, Jim Pearson, was a well-respected man in the community. He was more like a man's man. Uh, he basically spent a lot of time with my brother. They did all the sports together, and I really didn't have that much of a relationship with my father. I feared him, and I just tried not to stay around him that much. But all that changed around the age of 10, when Cheryl's mother was stricken by a rare blood disease, which left her chronically hospitalized. You essentially became the woman of the house. I did. Um, I would go to school during the day. I would help my grandparents raise my sister. And then um, when my father would come home from work, I would go with him up to the hospital to see my mother. Not much time to be a kid. Not at all. It just totally went into take care of everybody mode. By this time, Cheryl's older brother had moved out of the house, frustrated by his father's heavy-handed ways. He was the coach of my brother's, you know, baseball team, and he gotten thrown out of the le little league for cursing out his own players on the team, not even someone else's players. Cheryl soon found herself spending more time with her dad. It felt good initially felt, that your father was paying attention it did, to you. Because, you were you know, with him, going to the hospital, right. and doing things around the house. And believe it or not, you know, when my sister was born, I kind of felt like my mother was paying attention to her. I had the middle child syndrome that no one cared about me. You know, it was everybody, you know, doted on my sister, and I felt like I was losing my mom. And so all of a sudden now my father was paying attention to me, and it felt nice that somebody actually was appreciating me and taking care of me. Cheryl was just 11 years old. The only parent she'd ever been close to was dying. That's when Cheryl claims her father's attention would take a twisted turn. She would go from being his daughter to his demented desire. When did that attention turn into molestation? Uh, well, on the way to the hospital, he, you know, in the car, he's like, oh, come over and sit close to me. And he put his, you know, arm around me in the car. I would like sit in the middle spot. We had like a station wagon. and. You know, as his arm was around my shoulder, his hand would go lower and kind of start like roping my breast and, you know, it would go lower and it was, it was a little uncomfortable, but you know, he always just seemed like loving and, you know, and I never seen that side of him because we weren't a, an affectionate family. We didn't show love. We didn't say, I love you. We weren't huggy, kissy, anything like that. And then, you know, so I was like, oh, this was like a softer side of him because I was scared of him. According to Cheryl, the attention she experienced began to escalate. He was teaching me baseball, and we'd watch the Yankee games, and he watched the, the Yankee games in his bedroom, and I'd have to go watch the TV with him laying next to him, and he would force my hand to touch him. And so it got to the point where it wasn't just like just touching over the clothes, it was touching under the clothes. Alone and vulnerable, the so-called affection soon went to the darkest of all places. My father had called me one day and he said, you know, um, he couldn't fit in our attic space. Uh, we had to be pulled downstairs and he'd say, I need you to go up into the attic and get something. I had elastic shorts on and I said, okay. And he pulled the attic steps down and as I went to go up, up the ladder, he kind of just came up from behind me and just pulled my shorts down and kind of came up from behind me and had his pants down and just kind of inserted himself in me and I... You were 11. I was 11. Sadly, Cheryl claims that was only the beginning. What would happen if you tried to pull away? Uh, he'd get physical and angry. I mean, there was times when he was on top of me that I put the pillow over my face, and he was okay with that. As long as he got, you know, he got what he wanted. As long as he got the satisfaction, he was okay with that. I was scared. He, you know, it got, if I, if I pulled away, he, he got, you know, physical. Did you ever tell him no? I this did. This me? I did. I said no. I said please don't. It was easier to get it over with. He would make everybody's life more miserable 
and hurt other people. He'd kick the dog. And in case you're wondering, kick the dog wasn't just an expression. We were at the hospital one day, all day. He kicked my dog so hard from peeing on the kitchen floor because nobody was there to let it out that the dog died. This is what type of person he was. Any hope of her mother coming to the rescue ended tragically. How old were you when your mother died? I was 15. Cheryl was left to fend for herself, but a new man in her life is there to help her fight back. Up next, dad threatens to find a new object for his affection. He'd smirk at me, like keep going out, and the same thing's gonna happen to your sister. And a juvenile murder plot is hatched. And I just said, who would be crazy enough to kill somebody for money? And he said, I would. No little girl should ever have to endure what Cheryl Pearson went through. Sexually assaulted over and over again by the one man who should protect her, her father. But the high school cheerleader was cooking up a plan to stop that abuse permanently. At the tender age of 15, Cheryl Pearson lost her mother after a long illness. Yet from the age of 11, she carried a dark secret. At the funeral, when my mom died, people would say to you, don't worry, your mom's gonna protect you and watch over you, she'll watch you, she'll watch you. So now I have, thinking in my head now, she's in heaven watching over, this is happening. So at the funeral, I had promised her in the casket, I said, mom, you're gonna be seeing things you're not gonna like, and I'm sorry that I'm disappointing you, but you're gonna see things that you're not gonna like and just know that I don't like it. And I've tried to stop it. Then, in her freshman year of high school, Cheryl met Rob Cuccio, an upperclassman. And for Rob, it was love at first sight. I actually thought she was gorgeous. I still think she's gorgeous. But, uh, but seeing her across the gym, it was one of those moments. What did you like most about her personality? She was quirky. She really was. She had uh, a good sense of humor. She was just very nice, a very nice, genuine person. The two began dating, but always under the watchful eye and heavy hand of Cheryl's father. Cheryl wasn't allowed out of the house. I and mean, if she was, she had to be back in by 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock. It's pretty restrictive. Yes. Dating Cheryl was not easy. In the beginning was, was actually good. I got along well with her father. Uh, her brother had moved out, and I took over that role, helping him do some of the manly chores. The more I was there, the more I noticed that something wasn't correct. It didn't take long for me to get the uh, bug in my head of what was going on there. What was going on, according to Cheryl, is horrifying, claiming she was being sexually abused at the hands of her own father. And I would have to sit on my father's lap in front of Rob. One time I gave Rob the ice cream before I gave it to my father, and my father slapped me right across the face in front of Rob because slapped I- Slapped you. I didn't give the ice cream to my father. It was disrespectful. I didn't give it to my father first. The more Rob came around, the more he was showing that this is my girl, not yours. He kind of acted like a possessive boyfriend. In what way? Um, always asking her to sit on his lap, always um, hugging her, kissing her on the cheek, or having her kiss him on the cheek. And he would always shoot me a look as I was watching, you know, and it would be something that. I would do if I was trying to show somebody that it was my girl. It just didn't make sense. There was a lot of things that didn't make sense. Despite having a boyfriend, the sexual abuse continued. He would say stuff to me like, oh, just pretend I'm Rob. Sick stuff like that. Like I would enjoy it better because I had a, you know, a guy friend now. But Cheryl kept her dark secret. For now, there was a concern even greater than her own well-being. My father became very jealous and possessive, and if Rob wanted to take me out, he would threaten to say that he was going to start on my sister. Wait, wait, wait. When Rob, your boyfriend, mm -hmm. came over to the house to take you out for a date, mm -hmm. he would get jealous and say he would start to molest your younger sister? And I'd come home, and there he would be in the bed watching TV, bare chest, with my sister under the covers, sleeping on his chest, just like how it started with me. He was sending you a message? Oh yeah, and I'd walk in and he'd smirk at me, like keep going out, 
and the same thing's going to happen to your sister. Even more disturbing, at the time, Cheryl's little sister Joanne was only eight years old. Why didn't you run away? Go to police. I didn't run away because I wouldn't leave my sister and I couldn't take an eight-year-old with me. And I didn't go to the police because he had so many friends that were police and he told me every day that nobody would believe me. But Cheryl's defenses finally crumbled. Well, one day, we were having a little bit of an argument and Rob said to me, I know you're sleeping with your father. That's pretty aggressive. It was, but we were having a little bit of an argument and, and it just came out and... Did you really believe that? I did. And what did you say? I said, you're wrong. I don't know what you're talking about. How could you say that? You know, Chris, it just, it just wasn't right. Um, so I pressed Cheryl on it, and I continued to press her on it until she finally started crying and said, you're right. And I stopped to cry. And I said, please, please don't tell. I said, because if you tell, it'll hurt my sister. And I remember thinking, Wow, thinking it's one thing, but now having the confirmation is completely a, a, a different story. I guess it was that time in the car when she told me that she confided in me that I knew that I was going to be with her the rest of my life. No matter what it took, I was going to stay with her. It was shortly after that dramatic confession that another Long Island scandal caught Cheryl's attention. The news came on about this woman who lived in Mastic about her name was Beverly Wallace, who hired somebody to kill her husband for physically, mentally abusing her. And I just remember listening to it and going, oh my God, like. This could be a way out. This could be a way out for me. I didn't think of the murder part and I didn't think about the killing part. I just wanted it to stop. I couldn't take it anymore. I was so worried about my sister. I didn't care about me. Once the seed was planted, the desire to see her father dead began to grow. And I was thinking about it all night. While he was raping me that night, I was thinking about it. That morning, I was thinking about it. I went to school. I just sat. I just sat in my homeroom. Sean Pika was in front of me. And I just said, who would be crazy enough to kill somebody for money? And he said, I would. How did you go from there? He said, I would if the money was right. That's his exact words. And I said to him, well, how much would you do it for? And he said, a thousand dollars. Thousand bucks. I said, thousand dollars. He goes, yep. And I go, I know somebody that would, would do it for a thousand dollars. And he said, who? And I said, me. And he said, okay. That was it. How did he react when you told him the target was your father. No reaction. Just fine with it. No reaction. Did you tell Sean why you wanted your father dead? Did not. Did next. Just wanted to do it for the thousand dollars. How did you find out that Cheryl was going to hire a classmate to kill her father? You know, it was funny because when I found out, I said, come on, Cheryl, let's just run. I says, I know I'm 17 and you're 16. Not a great life, but we can go. And she wouldn't leave her sister. She said, I can't leave Joanne. But Cheryl and her classmate, Sean Pika, never spoke of the plot again, nor was any money exchanged. After you met with Sean, what did you think was going to happen? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I believe I convinced Cheryl that nothing was going to happen. It certainly looked that way until two months later when Cheryl woke up for school one morning, looked out the back window and saw her father lying in the driveway. I go running out the door. I stand over his body. I'm calling his name. He doesn't move. You yell your I'm father's name. He doesn't move. I go, Dad, Daddy. Did you see blood? I saw a little blood, but his head was kind of like face down and turned a little bit. Cheryl's neighbor calls an ambulance, and at first, all seems well. Once the ambulance is there, he tells me, everything's going to be all right. Dad just slipped and fell on the ice. Then Cheryl receives the shocking truth. Police officers come, come in the kitchen. Sorry for your loss. Sorry for your loss. Thought he just slipped on the ice. Joanne starts crying. 
police officer says to me, do you know who would have wanted to kill your father? What's going through your mind at this point? I said, kill my father. First, I didn't even know he was dead. What are you talking about, kill my father? Then I start crying. I didn't even know he was shot at this time. So then he takes me in the other room and tells me your father was shot five times. Suddenly, another Long Island scandal is born, and Cheryl is about to become a reluctant tabloid star. Up next, the naive murder scheme unravels. Did you realize how much trouble you were in at that point? Oh, yeah. And the miraculous turn of events that leads Cheryl to save Rob's life. Eight minutes later, they got a pulse back. James Pearson is dead, shot five times while leaving his driveway on his way to work. Three teenagers, his daughter Cheryl, her boyfriend Rob, and classmate Sean Pika are now scrambling to hide their murder-for-hire plot. Do you think the police believed you at this point? That you didn't have anything to do with this? Yes. Who paid Sean? Rob did. After the killing? Yes. Cheryl and Rob found $400 in her father's safe, 600 bucks short of what Pika demanded. I told him he would get the rest of it as soon as everything calmed down. And what did Sean say to you? No problem. When you get the money, which I was glad, you know, you had all of these things going through your head as to how this conversation was going to go, and it couldn't have gone any easier. I didn't think we were going to get caught. Maybe that was the 17-year-old naive kid that I was. I didn't think that it was ever going to come back to us. But it doesn't take police long to unravel the juvenile scheme at the heart of the murder. How did police get on to you? I believe Sean spoke to a couple of different people, and it started going around the high school. Running his mouth? Mm-hmm. That's what I think. Both Cheryl and Rob are brought in for questioning by police. They started to get loud and get in my face and tell me that they knew that I shot Cheryl's father. I said, no, I didn't shoot Cheryl's father. And they said, well, prove to me that you didn't shoot him. I said, because I paid the guy who shot him. You coughed it up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, without having law and order on every half hour, every hour, I didn't know to ask for a lawyer. I was scared. I was 17. And I had two guys with guns yelling at me. So, yeah, I, I didn't know it was him, <laughs> you know. Did you tell them, the police, what your father had done to you? Uh, not initially. I would have kept that secret to, to my grave. After that, they sat back and they knew that they had the case. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a second, guys. You don't know why. So let me explain to you why the man was killed. And then I was the one that told him Cheryl's secret. Did they believe you? They did. They were very good because they said to me, for a 42-year-old man that was had a sick wife that was never home for all those years, they, when they had went through the house, they didn't find any Playboy magazines. When they investigated it for a week, he never had a girlfriend, never had a date. Um, there was just too many odd things for a 42-year-old man never to be involved in any women. Your dad was a cop. You could have gone to him and said, look, this is the situation. This guy is raping his daughter, my girlfriend. And he probably would have gotten something done about it. In hindsight, that's probably what I should have done. Instead, you took part in a contract killing. I did. I did, which I never thought was going to happen. I honestly didn't believe it was going to happen. And then when it did, now I knew I was in some pretty deep stuff. You ultimately enter into a guilty plea. I did. I did the wrong thing. And how long did you spend in prison? Um, I wound up spending uh, three and a half months. Three and a half months? Yes. Do you still ask yourself why? Why did he do this to me? Every day. Why couldn't he just be normal? Why couldn't he just be a normal parent? Or why couldn't God have taken him instead of my mother? Why did he make my mother sick? For his part, Rob was sentenced to five years probation. But the trigger man, Sean Pika, would serve 16 years in prison. When you got out after three and a half months, who was the first person you saw? 
That was Rob. He was waiting for you. And my brother, Jimmy. But Cheryl's problems were just getting started. Outrageous headlines screamed across the New York tabloids, and many were outraged. Some claiming a 16-year-old daughter could mastermind her father's murder and be out in less than four months. While her older brother stood by her story of incest, her little sister Joanne didn't. Neither did her grandmother and aunt on her father's side, and that's where the courts sent her to live. They sent me back to my aunt and grandmother's house, <laughs> which was... Uh, what was that like? Oh, uh, talk about stressful. Um, to say the least. I tried to, you know, be with my sister, and she was angry with me, of course. She didn't understand. Uh, she was only eight. So your only two relatives, your father's sister and mother, did not believe your story? No. At just 16, Cheryl was in the eye of a hurricane of sensational headlines. And upon her release, she was hounded by reporters. What was it like for you to face all those cameras, all those reporters, when you got out after three nights? They were not kind to me. The tawdry tabloids had a field day. You know, they would be yelling, how many times a day did you have sex with your father? Like. Like, they were asking me what flavor ice cream I was having for the day. It was just... As if that wasn't enough, Cheryl was also carrying yet another secret. An unborn child. Did you worry that it was your father's child? I thought 100% it was my father's child. 100% I thought it was. You lost the baby. On purpose. Because I thought it was my father's. I miscarried on purpose. I was pushing something up there. And it turns out the child was actually Rob's. You were 16. Yeah, I was 16. Yeah. Trying to cope with an unbearable situation. And I was living at my aunt and grandmother's house and that's all they kept saying was that I was pregnant, that I killed their son, their brother. It was a horrible, horrible environment to be in there. Somehow, Cheryl and Rob remained together. Their remarkable love enduring the turmoil of sexual abuse, murder, and incarceration. They've been married 28 years, raised two successful daughters, yet nearly lost it all when Rob was hit by a massive heart attack at the age of 44. The whole story is just unbelievable. You were dead. I was dead. Rob had no pulse for 43 minutes. Doctors were ready to give up when Cheryl pleaded with them to keep going. And what did they do? They said, we'll give him 10 more minutes. We'll try for 10 more minutes, but after that, there's nothing else we could do. They work on Rob for 10 more minutes. What happens? After eight, he gets a pulse. He's alive. Barely, but he is. In that eight minutes, my two daughters stand on each side of his bed and cheer him on and say, come on, Dad, you can do it. Wake up for us. You can do it, Dad. Don't leave us. We need you. Mom needs you. Even when I wanted to give up, she wouldn't let me. And today? And today, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. It, it, it really is that she was able to pay me back for everything that I did, and I, and I wasn't looking for a payback. Cheryl recently wrote a book of love, strength, and perseverance, titled Incest, Murder, and a Miracle. She and Rob are pictured holding hands on the cover. That's why Cheryl put the cover of the book as us walking through that tunnel. No matter what happened before, you just persevere. You keep going, and you can make it. I just want people to know that you could have, you could still have a good life. It's work and it's hard. It's an inspirational book. Like we've had cancer patients read the book and say, if you guys can go through all these things, then I could go through one more day of fighting cancer. Like that's what we want you to know that just because you've been kicked, you could still get up. So what about the young student who pulled the trigger that day, Sean Pika? Tomorrow, I sit down with him for an all-new interview. Do you blame her at all? No. I did exactly what I set out to do. How the former Boy Scout and son of an NYPD officer became an unlikely hitman. And does he now regret his decision? 
does that haunt you? His answer and much more tomorrow on Crime Watch Daily. Up next, two young sisters home on the couch watching TV until the unexpected happens. There was this loud, like, thunder noise, and then it was like an explosion. The terrifying moments after a teen barely old enough to drive crashes into their house. 911. Somebody ran into our house and I can't get my daughter. Coming up. We're back now with the story of two sisters in Indiana who were just sitting on the couch watching TV. No one could have predicted what would happen next. We're teaming up with our Indianapolis affiliate, Fox 59, for the very latest. We can't get him out from underneath the car. A mother screams for help. Oh my God, please hurry. Her daughters are trapped under a car in their living room. Get us the car in our house. And this teenager in tears is accused of plowing into the house, running over the two young girls. Do you want to say anything to the family about what happened? Barely old enough to drive, police say Aaliyah Sierra was high and going more than 100 miles per hour. Like a rocket or something just going past. But she lost control and crashed through a family's living room. 911. Somebody wrecked into our house and I can't get my daughter. A crash that in an instant claimed the lives of two sisters and their mother's heart. I always said, as long as mommy's in the house, you have nothing to be afraid of. And I just, I hated it because I couldn't do anything to help them. What began as a typical summer night at the Fullerton's home in Frankfort, Indiana, quickly turned to sheer terror and panic. We can't get them out from underneath the car. They're underneath the car? Yes, the car's in our house. Shortly after 9 o'clock, sisters Haley and Callie were watching TV in the living room when police say a Honda Accord came barreling into their home at 107 miles per hour. There was this loud, like, thunder noise and then it was like an explosion. The impact so great, Bridget Fullerton's mother-in-law next door believed there had been an explosion. In our house, the explosion was in the house. There's an explosion? In the front wall, it exploded out. The Honda even knocked the home off its foundation as it careened through the family's living room, nearly exiting the other side. Oh my God, please hurry. Both Haley and Callie were pinned underneath the vehicle. Can you tell if either one of them are injured? I don't, we can't, they're not responding. The girl's brother, Jacob, and their grandfather desperately tried freeing the girls. My father-in-law's in the house, he's trying to get the car off the couch. But it was too late. The sisters were pronounced dead at the scene. Likely killed the instant police say 17-year-old Aaliyah Sierra drove into their house. Lost control, possibly went airborne, went off the road where they went airborne again, bounced and went into the uh, living room of the house. The marks in the grass show the car's deadly path. Aaliyah unable to avoid the house, even though it sits some 100 yards from the road. By the time she went off the roadway, she was kind of locked into where she was going. So she probably didn't even have any chance to correct. Police say not only was she speeding, Aaliyah tested positive for opiates. Reporter Alexis McAdams from our Indianapolis affiliate WXIN says, according to a police affidavit, There were other kids in the car at the time of the crash. Investigators did talk to them, some while they were still in the hospital. They told police they did ask Sierra to slow down, but she told them her car was very fast and called it a beast. Due to the seriousness of the crime, prosecutors charged the teen as an adult. Your child is home, and then within a matter of seconds, they're gone. So, I mean, there's nothing that can bring that back for families. In court, Aaliyah pleaded not guilty to 10 felonies. And even though the charges could send her to prison for decades, that's little consolation for the parents who lost their only two daughters. No matter what happens to her, if they let her go tomorrow, or if they put her in prison for life, our lives are still destroyed. I mean, it's never going to be the same. Even if she does have to do time, her mom can still go see her. We can't see our children. We have yeah. to go to the cemetery.